Um, welcome everyone. I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out what has happened. Just a second. Ah. Welcome to this session. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I was here in 2013. I bought this polo shirt that I was wearing for my talk in 2013. It was a blast. Everyone was like, ooh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good trick. It's the same polo shirt. I, I can assure you it has been washed at least once since 2013. <laughs> but I decided to wear it again as a, as a sign of respect and thank you to the people that brought me here. Thank you uh, for being here after lunch in this talk. It's going to be an experimental talk. It's the first time I'm using uh, this display. I've done similar things in meetups and things like that, but not in a talk. The talk is called The Core of Agile, and I'm going to be building on the same things I was explaining here uh, three years ago. In 2013, uh, I did a talk that was called Why Agile? And I did it in Spain for the Agile Spain conference. It worked really well. I did it here. We had a lot of fun. Um, in this talk, what I was saying is, why are you doing Agile? Oh, it's because they post-it notes. It's the, we are going to get hyper-productive. And I'm like, yeah, but how? No, it's because, you know, post-it notes, they have this magical field that when you put them on a, on a company, everything gets, like, perfect by magic, by Agile magic. And also, Jeff Sutherland says so. He says that if you do Scrum, you will become hyper-productive. Not just regular productive. That's not good enough for us. We want to be hyper-productive. No? I, I was like, shall we consider what's the, the, the real value that Agile is bringing for us? I mean, in that moment, I, I came to the conclusion that Agile was about two or three basic things. And suddenly, a year and a half later, Alistair Clover, one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto, he came with this idea of the heart of Agile. And he says, you know, at the end, at the very end, Agile is about four things. And it was basically the same four things I was promoting in 2013 as the, in this Why Agile talk. So I was really excited. We were into up to something. And then recently, you have uh, Joshua Kavievsky, also a person that is very influential in the Agile world. And he started talking about something he calls modern Agile. And again, modern Agile is about four things. So you were mentioning, maybe I'm going to tell you if Agile is coming to an end or something. You know, in these days, we have the scaling frameworks, and we have a lot of a lot of tools and approaches, and I think that the future of Agile might very well be in the past of Agile, in the beginning of Agile, in coming back to the core ideas behind Agility. And I'm going to give you uh, uh, some ideas on how to get practical on this, because it's very easy to be philosophical about the values and the principles and all that, and at the end of the day, I want to be the things that you can start doing on a Monday morning, okay? So that will be my goal for this talk. It's difficult, but I think I can do something like that. So, okay, Agile. I still have many customers that when I tell them about agility, especially when we talk about business customers, the people that uh, run the business, um, it's still difficult to describe what's agility. You know, you can say some people are like, oh, agility is sprints and, and cross-functional teams. And maybe it's about uh, post-it notes. And, you know, that, that we start putting all kinds of things around this, this concept of agility. For instance, Many of you has, okay, we already mentioned sprints. If you are working on sprints, then you might probably be doing Agile. And of course, how can you be Agile if you don't have post-it notes? And then you start uh, estimating things in story points. And you're like, what story points? Oh, it's the size of user stories. Uh, what's a user story? Oh, user stories, now we don't have features or we don't have requirements anymore. Uh, we have user stories because we are about the value uh, of, uh, to the customer. And then I see many companies where they have this customer that was saying, here you are, a thousand requirements, and now they are like, no, no, we are agile now. We have to tell user stories. I mean, they are like, oh, well, then as a user, I want you to deliver these thousand requirements <laughs> by Monday <laughs> so I can make my deadlines. How do you like that user story? <laughs> And now you are making user stories, and then you are using story points, and of course you have Kanban boards, those are nice, and of course you have uh, uh, automation everywhere. And then you start having new roles, now you have Scrum Masters. What's a Scrum Master? I don't know, Jeff Sutherland says we need Scrum Masters, you be the Scrum Master. Okay. <laughs> and then we start having product owners, and when we introduce... Uh, 
Mary Poppendick says that product owner is the worst thing that Scrum has done for the Agile community. I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> Not because of the concept, the concept is great, the name, the name sucks. Because product owner very rarely is the person that has the power to take decisions on the product. And if he takes the, if he's the, if he's the person, if she is the person that can, takes decision on the product, very rarely that person can be half of her time with the team helping them and performing the product owner role. That's why when I travel around the world helping big companies and medium companies to implement agile frameworks and to transform their companies, they say, oh, our biggest problem is that the product owner is not doing the product owner job. And I'm like, that very rarely happens with coders. <laughs> Nobody says the coder is not doing the coder job <laughs> because you will fire that guy. <laughs> it's evident. But if you're a product owner, you get not to do your job. How cool is that? Uh, okay, so people center themselves around all these ideas of, of tools and methods and frameworks and roles and processes. Uh, this is what Alistair Coburn calls barnacles. You know what's a barnacle? Is this a small animal that gets attached to the hull of a boat? In Spain and in Portugal, we eat them. They're delicious. Okay, it's like, like oh, you should try. But of course, you are, you're sailing a boat, and these small animals, they start getting attached to the hull of the boat. Well, okay, maybe one or two. It's not a big problem when you have thousands of barnacles. Then the boat cannot sail anymore. You have to get the boat out of the water. You have to clean all the hull and paint it again. Um, and Alistair Coburn says that all these kind of things, they might eventually be useful, even, even frameworks. Even if we say, okay, this is about, Agile is about Scrum, Agile is about SAFE. Hmm? I was coaching a company, I was trying to coach a company, they, they, they didn't hire me at the end, and they say, no, our problem is we want to implement SAFE. And I was like, no, that's not your problem. You have several problems, and somehow you have come to the conclusion that if you implement SAFE, you will solve your problems. Can we talk about the problems instead of the framework? And they were like, no, we want to implement SAFE. <laughs> okay, that's it. And uh, Okay, so a lot of people, instead of focusing on the idea of agility, they get lost in all these barnacles, okay? So, when I try to explain agile to the people, I go back to the only viable, valid definition of what's agility, which is the Agile Manifesto. Everything that came later on built on the foundations of the Agile Manifesto. You had a team of very talented and lucky people, because they were in the right place on the right time. <laughs> okay. um, they came with this beautiful definition of a new way of working. And as you probably know, the manifesto, it's, uh, it's uh, basically four values and 12 principles. And they say things like, we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We value adapting to change over following a plan. We value a customer collaboration over contract negotiation and all that. And I mention all these values to customers, and I try to also mention some of the principles, and usually the response I get from my customers is like, I don't get it. Uh, so yeah, okay, I have this legacy code in the core banking system, and now we are gonna individuals and interactions it. <laughs> What's the meaning of that? <laughs> When am I going to get my new core? <laughs> so yeah, okay, I get the manifesto. I think I get the manifesto. I've been, you know, I've been reading that piece of literature for 15 years or 20 or 10 years or whatever, and I've been trying to. Exp There's a lot of wisdom behind those words, but for most people, when you talk them about the Agile manifesto, they just don't get it. It's like, okay, but tell me more about how are we going to change things in our company. So I brought it down, you know, after a lot of analyzing manifesto, I brought it down to four dimensions. Four things that you have to talk to your people about. If you want to fire an agile transformation in your company, what you have to do is start conversations around these four topics. That's it, these four things. So the first thing you have to start talking about is about early and continuous delivery of value. Value is a big word. Uh, you'd be surprised, or maybe not, if you, if you knew how many companies I will stop someone in a, in a hallway and say, you, how do we do provide, how do we provide value? And they don't know. They, uh, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an IT guy. 
My mission on Earth is to prevent things from going into production. That's what we do in infrastructure. Do not go into production, because if you put things into production, then the servers, they get stressed. And that shouldn't happen. So I don't know about value, I don't know what we build in this company, that's my role, and they're like, fucking. <laughs> so you realize that that person is doing something that he thinks is the right thing to do, but he's actually harming customers, and he's harming our ability to deliver value to the customers, okay? And you'd be surprised how many people in accounting, or in, in IT, or in development, or in innovation, marketing, they don't actually understand how the company provides value to the customers. Then another dimension that we should start conversations around, it's uh, adaptation. Adapting to customer needs. Including the customer in the equation. Collaborating with your customer. Not just deliver, 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 deliver. A lot of people have believed that Agile or Scrum or whatever the framework you prefer, it's about productivity and hyperproductive teams. And productivity has been a big word in the Agile ecosystem. And I think it's time we banish this word from our conversations. Because what we're doing is we have these statistics that says that 40% of the software we're doing worldwide gets never used by no one. And if you are doing a lot of crap, you don't want to do twice the crap twice as fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's not your problem. You should be actually looking at what you're doing and saying, why are we producing 40% of features nobody wants? Sometimes they say, okay, maybe people are using your features. Let me put it this way. 40% of the software you're doing in your organization, you can do it and it will provide some value, but you could also not do it and nothing will happen. So that's terrible. I mean, and then we put a lot of pressure into people and in the deadlines and we get a lot of, you know, turnover. People get burned out and leave the company because we are doing something that, man, we could also not do it. That's terrible, and we still talk about productivity, and I think that productivity is not the game anymore. That was the game for industrial companies in the Taylor age. Then we also have another dimension, another thing that we can talk about, which is collaboration. I wholeheartedly remember the first time I read this book by Alistair Coburn's Agile Software Development, The Cooperative Game. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna learn a lot about agility, and I start reading the book. The first hundred pages, it's about communication. People, communication, 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 and I was like, Alistair, where are we going to start delivering software? And he was like, no, 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 communication, communication. Uh, fuck this guy. <laughs> I want to know how to do unit testing and all that. And then years later, I read the book again, and I was like, oh my god, he was so right. Okay, the guy, you know, he's been around for a while, and he knows what he's talking about. Um, and yeah, collaboration is the name of the game. Uh, I still have, you know, companies that need, they are in the early stages of agile transformations and then you, they have teams and then you, you have the yellow team, you have five people, okay, that's great, and then you have the pink team and there's four people in that team, okay, that's nice, and then we have the violet team and I'm like, how many people do we have in that team? And they say, no, just one, violet, come, this guy wants to meet you, and I say, hi, I'm violet, <laughs> I am the violet team, and you're like, what? <laughs> A team of one! I've seen scores of companies worldwide having teams of one. It makes no freaking sense. It's a joke. Uh, but you know, the book says we have to make, the, we, we need to have teams. So hey, Violet, what? Now you are a team. Oh gosh, I feel so creative and productive now. Ooh, it's like I have superpowers. <laughs> what? Uh, it's, it's the same thing with leadership, okay? Now they say, no, in order to have collaborating teams, self-organizing teams, motivated individuals, high-performing teams, you have to get rid of bosses, and you need leaders, people who inspire, people who are able to make people reach their full potential. And then a lot of companies, they say, hey, John, say what? Now you are not the, the human resource manager anymore, now you are the human resource leader. And you're like, ooh. <laughs> That's so cool. And then you have a warehouse manager. He's not the warehouse manager anymore. He's the warehouse leader. And he's like, what's a warehouse leader? And I don't know. It's like a warehouse manager, but better. <laughs> so we actually don't understand what are the dimensions of collaboration and, and, and leadership and all that. And then, of course, that's my personal favorite. Of course, it, it, it probably could involve all the other three. But if you don't have continuous improvement, oops, sorry then I don't know what we're doing. Um, I've helped so many companies to implement a framework, which is not the final game, but it's a step in the game. And then I visited them two years ago, and they are in the exact same stage 
that I left them because that was better than what they had before. So we're right, we're fine, this is just fine, just good, just fine, just good, it's not the name of the game. We should have something better than that. We should be able to produce better things and we should have change agents in our companies and, and groups of people that are constantly trying not only to remove impediments, you know, in the Scrum we talk about remove impediments, but there are many things that we can do in, in order to improve that it's not ultimately remove impediments. You can develop your people. Developing your people, having better developers, having better managers, having better analysts, having a better communication with your customer, having your customer more frequently involved in your, maybe you can call that an impediment, but okay, it's, it's bigger than that. Maybe trying new things, implementing new methods, uh, trying to investigate, research, innovate, learn. Learning is not removing impediments, it's another dimension of continuous improvement. So there's a lot to be done in the continuous improvement dimension. So for me, actually, it's about these four things. Usually when I explain these things, when I have a little more time, because today we are tight on schedule, but when I have more time, uh, I go into each of those dimensions. And for instance, when I talk about early and continuous delivery of value, I say, okay, we all think sprints and we all think uh, sprint reviews, but there's also the portfolio management. If we are starting, you know, every single healthy company in the planet has more projects and initiatives than the ones they can actually do. That's the definition of a healthy company. If you have more capacity than projects, then you're not healthy, you have a problem. <laughs> you have to fire people because you have a lot of capacity and you're idle, you have nothing to do, that's not healthy. Usually you will have more projects than capacity to do those projects. And then when you are not able to do them all, and all of them seem so interesting, our managers cannot prioritize. They didn't know how to take decisions and kill projects and say, no, I'm sorry, we have, a, uh, we have the capability of doing six projects in this year, or maybe six projects this quarter. So we are not doing this, we are not doing this, and we are not doing this and this and this. And then maybe this we're doing, and then maybe this and this we are doing, and then maybe this, and oops, there's no more time for doing projects. So these ones, they will have to wait. And everything you don't kill, you put in a queue. And if you start many projects at the same time, you know what happens. You will lower the productivity of the company, you will lower the efficiency. You have 100 people and you have 100 projects, it will be a matter of time that someone says, oh, I've had an idea. We have 100 developers, we have 100 projects. You see? <laughs> we one person in each project, all projects get done. It's amazing. And it's, and it's a very bad idea. Okay, it's a bad idea trademark. Okay, so you shouldn't be doing that. That's part of agility. How do you solve that? With daily meetings, with post-its on the wall? You solve that with, I don't know, uh, scrum masters and retrospectives? Probably you will need to change the way you're managing the portfolio in your company. And that's also agility, because that will make us focus on the few projects that will deliver the most value to the customer. And for me, that's part of that dimension of early and continuous delivery of projects, of value. Then we also have these companies, uh, you know, we all come from a, a, a background where we had these uh, deadlines for projects and we were used of, uh, to have a, a value delivery that was like something like this. We deliver nothing, 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 we deliver nothing. We reach a deadline, we deliver nothing, we deliver nothing, we deliver nothing. And then suddenly we deliver everything. Okay, this is the Death March project, okay? By the way, this joke, it works everywhere in the planet. You know, I like to make people laugh, and you know, stand up comedy is difficult when you have different cultures like Latin America, Israel. Oh, I get into much trouble into Israel. I always make the wrong joke in Israel. It's very easy to step in, but they are very forgiving. But this one, it works everywhere. We've all been there. So, and then we have some people that are implementing Agile frameworks, and they are Spring 1, Spring 2, Spring 3, Spring 21. Do you have something in production? No. We have something you can show you in staging. What's staging? Or it works on my machine, that's brilliant. <laughs> okay, I'll plug your machine, we're going to put it on the data center. <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, maybe you are playing with the idea, you should go a little bit further. You should be able to actually deliver and put things into production earlier and more continuously. Amazon, is putting things into production every 16 seconds, 3,500 times a day. That's the name of the game, and you know, I'm working with banks this day, and they are like, they are like we can put something into production in 18 months. And I'm like, okay, if we 
if we bring that down to nine months, that's 100% improvement. <laughs> it's not the end of the game, it's not the goal, but we should start somewhere. Uh, one of the things that happened to me in Agile Transformations is that I believe that everyone should start doing continuous improvement on a Monday morning, 8 a.m. That's not gonna happen in a bank. Okay, so you have to be progressive, you have to be continuous. The same way we deliver value in Agile projects. We should have something like continuous integration. I mean, we should be doing small deliveries, and maybe we are not faster, maybe we are not more, more productive, but if we reach a deadline and we have some 80% of the value ready to be launched, then I have a competitive advantage. Because I'm like, okay, I still wanted those 20% of features, but guess what? Experience tells me most of the features that are at the end of the project, nobody wants them, or if you've done things right and you've actually prioritized those features that are mandatory, needed, the ones that make sense on the project, then you have a decision. Then you can say, okay, maybe we can wait and say, okay, until it's done, so you have in the same situation, or we can launch version one and then wait a couple of months and then launch version two, and that's an option we didn't have before because it was all or nothing. Or maybe we can say, guess what? Right now, there's another opportunity somewhere else. I can get that, this team and put them to work into something that will bring billions to a company. In the other case, how many times we have an opportunity, there's no one available. Everyone is so busy for a year's time because they are in huge projects. Being able to break projects into smaller initiatives, being able to manage the portfolio at a level where the biggest thing you, you accomplish is three months or two months, <coughs> four months, that gives you a lot of agility at a business level. So I think that this should also be the name of the game. Not only daily meetings, not only user stories. Okay? This is far more important for your customer. And then when we talk about adaptation, again, um, I have customers that they are doing, uh, they, they implement some kind of agile method, and they are like sprint one, sprint two, sprint three, sprint four, and the customer says, I need something now. No, no, sorry. We've done the back end, the back back end, and the back 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 end. <laughs> But there's no front end yet. <laughs> but we're doing sprints, okay, and we have daily meetings, and we have Scrum, and we have retrospectives, so yeah, I guess we're agile, right? We do everything by the book. Um, but still the customer is just like, I don't have nothing. And then he's like, oh, so you haven't started the front end yet, because I have new ideas on how I would I like the front end, and they're like, no, sorry. Keep them for yourself. We are gonna finish this project and then you can fire another project to redo the front end because all the back end has been made with the front end in mind. If you change the front end now, we have to change the back end. That's a lot of work. We're not gonna do that. And I'm like, so you were what, Agile? <laughs> and, and they call themselves an Agile company and they all have these nifty certificates that say, that said, I dose it off for two days in a certified Scrum Master course. And at the end I got this lousy certificate. You know for a fact there are cats that are certified Scrum Masters, right? <laughs> this is a fact. There are cats that are certified Scrum Masters. They were dozing off in a seminar, and when they woke up, they had a certificate stapled to their ear. <laughs> <laughs> now you're certified. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, yay, we are agile. No, you're not. Or you're not as agile as you could be. I think that the adaptation dimension of agility <clears throat> would mean that we start with an idea and we are like, yeah, probably this is going to look like a big square or something, but then we open the possibility that at the middle of the project we understand that we need some triangles, and at the end of the project we understand that we don't need so many triangles, maybe we need some circles. And that's something that will happen, and that's how we maximize value for the final customer. If you are not able to do that in your projects, you have to rethink your concept of agility. And it doesn't matter if you're doing sprints. It doesn't matter if you're doing backlogs. I always say that it's very easy, you know, it's very easy to get. You keep doing this, this, the things the same way you've done them for your whole life, but then suddenly you have a wall, and everything you have to do, you put up on a post-it note, and in a column that says it needs to be done. When you're doing that, then you move it to another column that says we're doing that, and then when it's done, you move it to another column that says it's done, and yay, guess what? We are agile. And then someone says, no, because in order to do Scrum, there's already also these ceremonies. Ceremonies, <laughs> amazing name. And they say, no, no, yeah, we are already doing the ceremonies. You have the project manager, now he's called the product owner, and he comes once a month with a lot of work and says, this needs to be done in a month. <laughs> so now we have a backlog, that's a product planning session, and now we have a estimation for the uh, commitment for the sprint. Because we are doing uh, one month sprints, or six months sprints, okay? <laughs> 
And then we work every day and the project manager, oh sorry, product owner comes every day and says, are you done yet? You said you were going to do five user stories this week, you only did three, why? Have you tried working faster? <laughs> Guess what, we never thought about that, that's a cool idea, let's work faster. <laughs> let's program faster, cool, brilliant. And then once a month we deliver something and the customer yells at us, saying this is not what I wanted, we call that the spring review, and then we go to a bar, we order some gin tonics or some beers if we're in Germany, and then we look at each other and we say, man, it sucks being us. And that's the retrospective, and it's a check, 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 check. <laughs> Certified, you are doing Scrum. <laughs> so for me, you know, I'm a big fan of Scrum. I do Scrum in all my customers. I'm not bashing Scrum. I'm saying it's very easy to fake Scrum. Second most easiest thing to fake, okay, I'm not going that way. <laughs> I'm running out of time. I was going to talk about collaboration. I talk about the startup syndrome where we have four or five guys and, and, and they work along together and they are super happy and they start to make magic and then the company starts to really, really work well and then suddenly they have a lot of work. So maybe the developer starts to hire more developers. And then one day he's like, oh, and I also need some uh, architect. Uh, maybe probably I will need some IT guys. So you have specialization. And then suddenly the designer, of course, the guy with the beard and the thick glasses, that's the designer, of course. <laughs> then he says, I need more designers. I need more hipsters for my company. <laughs> we have to be a hipster company. <laughs> Even the girls, even the girls have bears. And, <laughs> and then suddenly he needs a UX specialist, and then he needs someone that is a specialist in search engine management and search engine optimization. And you know what? When there were four guys in a flat trying to make some business, they could do everything uh, together, and, and everything, everyone could do anything. But now suddenly, if the UX guys it's ill and it's, or it's on holiday, it's not possible to do anything in the whole company because the US guy is not here. So he's not, he, he's not approving the designs, he's not approving the interfaces, so we cannot put anything into production until these guys come here. And also when he comes, but then the IT guy is on vacation, nobody can put anything into production because you cannot log into the machine and you cannot you know, run scripts on the machine and you cannot ping the machine. Because you know, ICMP packets, they are so dangerous. <laughs> they could kill the server. <laughs> and then suddenly the, the money guy starts hiring more people to do accounting, and then suddenly he also needs an analyst. And then one day they are like, we need a marketing manager. And then they hire someone that joins the C-level um, executive board meeting, and then suddenly this new guy that is doing marketing and the technical guy, they hate each other. And they cannot talk to each other. And then suddenly you have 200 people and then you start crossing people in the, in the, in the company and they're like, who's that guy? I don't know. And then one day these four guys, they meet together in a bar and they look at each other and say, dude, what has happened? We were cool. And now we are mainstream, we are another instance of the corporate madness. Why? Because we started doing departments, we started doing silos. Everyone started focusing on their own part of the work instead of looking to each other and collaborating together. So another thing you should be looking at your, at your company if you want to improve agility is your ability to collaborate transfer, uh, across your whole company and, and structure yourself according to value streams. Where a value stream is, since we detect a necessity, a need for a customer, until the need is fulfilled and the customer has paid us and he's happy, how many people is needed? How many people need to collaborate in that stream? And we should maximize our ability to make that people collaborate together. I call that, well I call that, I, um, I recently bumped into this concept from Starbucks. And in Starbucks they say everything in this company works for the barista. The barista, the person that prepares the coffee, is the customer touch point. When I go to Starbucks, the person that represents Starbucks for me is the barista. He's the one delivering the Starbucks experience for me. So it shouldn't happen that the barista says, hey, there's no coffee, we need more coffee. And then someone from the purchasing department is like, oh, whoa, 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 what do you mean more coffee? You need to create a request and you need a budget allocation. And then you have to give me a list of three approved vendors and then we have to make an RFP, and then we have to negotiate the prices of the coffee, and then you need to provide also a forecast on how much coffee are you going to be using over the next five years, and you're like, I quit. <laughs> That's the difference between
between having a department, a purchasing department, which is an enabler, someone that makes possible that every single time I try to grab coffee, there's coffee there, that's your job, from a bottleneck. But it's very easy for people, once they feel they are in control of the purchasing process, they start building APIs, interfaces. Instead of talking to people, hey, what do you need? They build an interface. And you're, excuse me, no, 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 don't talk to me. Open a ticket. <laughs> like the IT guys, do not talk to me. I'm not here, I'm a ninja, you can't see me. <laughs> Open a ticket. <laughs> That's an API. I mean, we created an interface so we can talk to each other. What the actual fudge? Okay, so. I don't care how many user stories you have in your backlog. You can't talk to people in your company saying, I have a problem, I need help. There's a value stream stalled because you cannot help us. I don't care about how many tools and methods and process and frameworks do you have installed. Okay, so that will be the collaboration level. Finally, in order to finish my talk, and I will give you five minutes for questions, uh, when it comes to, to continuous improvement, uh, it's very similar to the, the value delivery. Uh, a lot of people, when I talk to customers, they are like, well, how long is it going to take the idle transformation? And I'm like, wrong answer, question, irrelevant answer. Wrong question, irrelevant answer. Wrong question, because you believe that in an idle transformation, there's a beginning where you are not agile, you are not agile, you are not agile, and on a given deadline, now we are agile. <laughs> of course, that's your mindset. You've been doing that for your whole life, and you still think that transformation were that way. It's not that way, okay? It's probably more an asymptote to perfection. We will never be perfect. We will still struggle year after year after year after year to be better. Uh, so it makes no sense to say how much it's going to take, how long it's going to take, because there's no beginning and ending. We cannot measure that. Okay? Uh, you know that in martial arts, all the black belt thing came because when Western people, we started doing martial arts, we were like, how long is it going to take me to learn karate? Because I saw this, or, or Kung Fu, I saw this movie, The Matrix, they put something in your head and said, ah, now I know Kung Fu. Okay? <laughs> That's our mindset. I know Kung Fu, every Kung Fu, forever. <laughs> And then the Japanese and Chinese martial artists, they were like, no, it's not that way. You could spend seven lives perfecting your martial arts and you still will have things to learn. And then Western was like, oh, then I'm not interested. That's too long, seven lives. <laughs> and then they had to say, okay, in six years we will give you a, a, a black belt. How cool is that? And well, then now I sign in. So you have to write something. And I do believe that the certificate industry is the black belts of agility. We have to collect something. Hey, here you are, here you are. Oh, no, I'm agility. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to take the SPC safe certification class and exam soon. Okay, so I'm bitching about certificates and still I'm going to get into the certificate industries because people everywhere, all companies in the world are like, yeah, okay, I understand, but where are my certificates? <laughs> I'm like, okay, you've won. <laughs> So anyway, that, that's not the important thing. It's a perk or maybe something nice or maybe something, you know, like a party you throw in some point in order to say, hey, you, we've reached this point, now let's keep going. The point is that if you think there's a deadline and now we're done, then you are still have to understand what's the duty. And I said, wrong question, irrelevant answer. Why irrelevant answer? Imagine that I could say, okay, there's a path. There's something you can do every single day of your life. And each day you do it, you will be a little bit happier, a little bit happier, a little bit happier, every single day of your life. And maybe in 40 years time, maybe in 60 years time, maybe in seven lives, you will reach nirvana, which is the liberation of suffering, the liberation of the wheel of, of uh, samsara. You will be out of that. How cool is that? And you are like, well, I mean, 40 years, 60 years, seven lives, I'm not interested. I prefer to feel miserable for the rest of my life. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you that every single life you practice this path, you will be a little bit happier. How cool is that? That's it. A little bit happier. No, I'm not interested. I prefer to be miserable. Makes no sense. So even if I told you it's going to take six years to make your company agile, who cares? Every single moment, every single day, you, you feel that for those six years it will be suffering, 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 and then suddenly nirvana. No, it's not that way. Every single day we start practicing agility, we're improving things. So we start with this uh, project that take 18 months to go into production, and suddenly we are able to do them in nine months. Oh, that's cool, but then suddenly we can do them in four months. And that's like, whoa, warp speed for banking. Okay, they're like, woo! 
I'm busy. <laughs> and then suddenly we are doing that every two months, and then suddenly every month, and then suddenly every two weeks. And even if you are able to push software to production every two weeks, you should try to do that every week. And then you should try to put software into production every day, and then every hour, and then every second. And then, well, if you are doing every second of your life, you can stop there. <laughs> Once a second, that's cool. You can stop there. You have my permission. So. Again, this is a dimension of, of uh, continuous improvement. And the last thing I wanted to tell you, and to give you something practical, how are we using this philosophy in a practical way? Well, a lot of companies, they are like, we want to measure our agility. We want to assess our agility. And I'm like, not the point, dude, but still, it's important for a lot of big companies, insurance, banking, they have their own processes. We have to play by their rules and play inside the system. What are we doing? We are presenting a graph where we have four dimensions. Early and continuous delivery of value, collaboration with the customer, collaboration in high performance teams, continuous improvement. For each of these dimensions, we are creating several questions. So we are asking the team, do you feel like the customer is available for you during the whole sprint from one to 10? And they are like zero, or they are like six, or they are like seven. And, if this, and we also use the perfection game in the sense that if you don't say 10, if you say seven, you have to also tell us what do you need in order to make it an eight? And what would be a 10? So they are also giving us ideas. If the customer was available at least on the phone every two days, that would be an 8. So we are like, cool, that's something we can try in order to improve customer collaboration, customer availability. And then we rate those numbers. Then these numbers are absolutely you know, qualitative. Still, it's important. A lot of companies, they are like, no, 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 but I have to measure that with, a, with like a Geiger counter. 1,256 Agile points. It's not going to happen, but you, can also, you can't also use that in your relationship with someone. You're like, oh, my girl, she loves me so much. How do you know? What's the KPI? What's the KPI? Where are you measuring? You need some metrics probably to know that. But no. Either you know or you don't. And if you don't, back you. That's a bad tip. So anyway, we have these questions and we have some variables. And we ask people how happy you are. And in three months, we ask them again. And there are some things that they are still unhappy, and there are some things that have improved a little bit. And we reflect that in the graph, and we show people, okay, we've improved in collaboration, we've improved in value delivery, still we need a lot to improve in customer collaboration and adaptation. And why? Oh, we are very low in these markers. Like, for instance, in our ability to um, bring the customer to client meetings, or we are not able to introduce changes once we are past a certain point in the project, or whatever. You decide in your company what's important for you, what's your problem. So this is a tool, we call it the Agile Assessment Tool, or you can call it whatever you want, or you can adapt it, there's several other ways we are using it, but the idea is using these four dimensions to plan your transformation and to trigger and fire uh, relevant conversations around what's the deal. So that was my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. I think we still have like no. five minutes for yes, questions. Yes, we now have uh, five minutes for questions, and um, we will do it in English. So, who wants to ask a question? <coughs> so, I have some. <laughs> Um, let me start. I found it very interesting uh, uh, that you mentioned uh, the product owner is uh, often a person uh, who uh, has not got the time uh, for doing the, the tasks he, is, um, hmm. he has to do. So how to solve that problem? How do you do it, how do you do it uh, in the company's view, coach? Yeah. Uh, the problem is in the name, product owner. It's a very, very bad name because uh, you know if you are the marketing manager or if you are the client, you feel that it's your product. And when you know there's something called the product owner, you're like, I own that product. Okay, <laughs> I was going to swear. <laughs> um, um, so in some cases, the problem is that you have the wrong person doing the product owner role. My opinion, when you read the original papers by, by Alistair Coburn, by Jeff Sutlam and Ken Schraver, they were talking about small teams that were able to be collocated with the customer, and the customer was working with them on a regular basis. If you have that possibility, that's great. But for most of the big companies, when you try to scale that out to huge projects, usually it's not uh, 
it's not realistic to think that your customer is going to be sitting with the team for at least half, percent, half of the time. So what we are doing is we are creating a product management team which has several duties like defining the strategy of the product, where should it go, what problem are we trying to solve, if what we have right now is fulfilling that problem or not. And then we have the actual product owners which are the ones that are performing the scrum slash software development slash product development part. So we have product management, product development is different. In product management, you have people interviewing customers and doing focus groups, and you have people analyzing the, the, the competitors and the market forces, and they are analyzing <coughs> technology, and they are trying to figure out what's valuable, what's usable, what's feasible. Okay, so there, there's a lot of UX and analysis and product, but then you have someone that is breaking requirements and writing user stories and trying to make the team understand what the customer needs and they are available on a daily basis and they are also providing estimates and, and deadlines. So for me the Scrum product owner is someone that needs to fulfill four duties, solve four problems. The problem of understanding, the problem of prioritization, the problem of information and the problem of adaptation. You need someone that helps the team to understand what they are supposed to deliver. You need someone who needs to prioritize. You have several people saying, we want this, and you're like, whoa, 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 we can only build one thing today, so we have to figure out which is the most valuable thing we can build today. And you have the information problem. You, have, you need someone that is able to say, okay, this is going to cost $5 million, but we see that probably this is going to take six months. And that information, according to this project, is something that the product owner should be doing. And then you have the, the, the adaptation problem, which is showing something to the customer and saying, is this what you asked for? And if it is, is it solving your problem? Because if you ask for this, but if it's not solving your problem, we can change it. We can provide something different. Problem is, sometimes the customer is already the product owner, and now you have to fix that. You cannot say, I'm taking the product owner role from you, because then he's going to be like pissed off. So what do we do? We create a new role, the gatekeeper or the delivery manager. So you keep doing the product owner thing you were doing, whatever it is. Now we have someone that we call the delivery manager. What's doing the delivery manager? Understanding, adaptation, information, uh, uh, prioritization. So we create an a intermediate role. That's one way you can approach the problem. It depends on the context, of course. Thank you. More questions? Okay, I think it's fair. We can leave it here and have some coffee. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>